Any race is fine. I personally recommend Wood Elf for extra movement speed, and free proficiencies in perception and stealth. For more offensive options, go with Duergar, as they have non-concentration enlarge at level 3 to boost your weapon damage, and unlimited invisibility at level 5. The build will also work on any companions, although the power pick would be Astarian, as his unique happy condition grants plus 1 to all attack rolls and saving throws. If led ascended, Asterion can have additional 1d10 necrotic to weapon damage, but in return, he'll become more evil. Dexterity is your main stat to increase damage and accuracy on ranged weapons, as well as bonus modifiers for initiative and armor class. Wisdom is the substat, to resist mental crowd controls, and also to get extra damage on attacks thanks to a certain rare headgear. You'll have three feats, Take two ability improvement to soft cap dexterity at 20, and sharpshooter feet for flat damage boost. Use Mirror of Loss in Act 3 to get another plus 2 for 22 dexterity. Follow the feats order shown here. It is not recommended to take sharpshooter as first feat, since it will be detrimental to your accuracy if you don't have a reliable way yet to offset the penalty. It's better to take sharpshooter as second feat when your character is more fleshed out. At level 2, you can now action surge once every short rest to do more attacks. This action can also trigger extra attack feature later on. Start with Battlemaster subclass. It has strong maneuvers that will be very useful early on. We can respect into champion subclass later down the line. Each battle maneuvers cost superiority dice on use, and they recharge on short rest. Menacing attack can pin enemy in place and give disadvantage on attacks, making them less of a threat. Trip attack can knock enemy prone, preventing them from taking action or reaction, which effectively deny most boss legendary action on honor mode. Precision attack adds superiority die to attack roll for whenever you have trouble with accuracy. On top of the useful effects maneuver offer, they also deal 1d8 additional damage, so don't hesitate to spam them just for damaging purpose. Fighter gain their first extra attack at level 5. This feature allow you to perform two weapon attacks per action, and it's limited to only the default action and action surge. Any other actions granted from different source won't benefit from extra attack in honor mode. By taking sharpshooter feet, your ranged weapon attacks receive a big boost with plus 10 additional damage, but they have a minus 5 penalty to attack rolls. However, the penalty can be easily offset around this level thanks to equipments and buffs. Whenever crowd controls are not needed, you can use maneuvering attack instead to boost your weapon damage, while also increasing an ally movement speed so they could zoom around better. Multiclass into Cleric at level 9 and pick War Domain, which allow you to make an additional weapon attack using a bonus action and a War Priest charge. This attack can also use special arrows. On top of that, War Cleric have access to spells that further increase your damage output. A level 2 War Cleric can use a reaction to gain plus 10 to an attack roll, at the cost of 1 Divinity Charge. It essentially allow you to turn a hit into a miss every short rest. Respect your character at level 11, then put all the levels back into Fighter. This time grab Champion Subclass instead, so you could work toward crit build with the reduced crit range. At level 11 of Fighter, they get a big power up from improved extra attack, which now do 3 attacks per action. 
For last level, dip into War Cleric again for the bonus action attack and some useful spells. In total, you'll have 10 attacks in the first turn and 6 attacks on subsequent turns on Honor Mode. After Champion subclass is taken, you'll be using mostly special arrows to enhance your attacks, which are superior than Battlemaster maneuvers in both damage dealing and utility purposes. On that note, if you were already well stocked on special arrows, you could switch to Champion subclass sooner before Act 3. There are many different special arrows and each have their own uses, however I'll be pointing out just the notable ones. Starting with elemental arrows, acid arrows are great early on to reduce target AC by 2. Ice arrow can leave behind an ice surface, possibly knocking enemy prone. On top of their useful surface effects, they also deal 2d4 additional elemental damage if target failed a dex save. So if you were focusing on just damage, Arrow of Illmater is better as it has no save and always guarantee the 1d4 bonus neurotic damage. There is also an unintended interaction with Titan String, in which the bow unique strength modifier damage get reapplied again on the necrotic damage, making this arrow even much more stronger at the moment. Arrow of many targets are really great at clearing group of enemies, hitting up to total 4 targets per shot. Considering how many attacks fighter have, you can clear an entire room in a single turn on your own. Arrow of slaying are boss killers, as they double your damage on a specific type of enemy. Because of this nature, the damage can get a lot stronger the more additional damage you stack. Slaying Arrow's damage output is even more powerful when you factor in critical hit and vulnerability. This means as long as you have arrows stocked up, no boss is going to survive your onslaught of slaying arrows. As for how to obtain special arrows, they are commonly sold by most merchants and easy to steal by any character with proficiency and expertise in sleight of hand. Something caught your eye then? Careful. Make sure to grant advantage on whoever does the stealing, either from equipment or buff, so they don't risk rolling a critical failure. Merchant wares reset after a long rest or upon leveling up, so you can stick to one merchant and farm as much arrows as you need in one go. For example here, I level up a hireling to get new wares and keep on stealing. Illithid powers have certain synergies to this build in mind, however the core build will work just fine if you don't feel like using these powers. Otherwise start with Luck of the Far Realms for a guaranteed crit every long rest. Psionic Overload is really good once you have Awakened Passive to use it as bonus action, adding 1d4 psychic damage to every attacks, 
which easily becomes 2d4 with vulnerability or 4d4 once you spec into crit build toward the end. Ability Drain is a nice little bonus to increase your accuracy by reducing enemy AC that use dexterity. This power also activates some of the gear effects you'll be equipping. Shield of Thralls adds 10 temp HP for extra survival and can stun nearby enemies when the shield is broken. Later in Act 3, there's a gloves that you can use to activate the stun on command, while also gaining an additional attack. If you decide to go full Brainiac, then Call the Weak is very powerful, as it confirmed kill low HP enemies. This save you the actions or resources that would have been used to finish them off. Equipments highlighted in red are core gear of the build. If there are two core gear overlapping, it means either will work in case one piece is taken by other party member. This build starts off strong as Titan String is actually one of the best hard-hitting bow and it's available right in Act 1. The bow adds both your dexterity and strength modifier to damage. You can utilize this by simply carrying Club of Hill Giant for 19 strength. Additionally, you could also drink Elixirs of Hill Giant or Cloud Giant for 21 strength and 27 strength respectively. Doing so allow you to carry different stat sticks instead of the club. Titan String will easily carry you all the way to late Act 3 before you finally get a better upgrade. That's how good the bow is. You can stock up on Elixir of Hill Giant in Act 1 by buying from Auntie Ethel, who has 3 pot every reset or steal from Dareth, who has one pot each reset. As for Elixir of Cloud Giant, they are sold by most alchemy vendors when your party reach level 9 or above. Broodmother's Revenge Amulet adds 1d6 poison damage to weapon attacks for 3 turns, while Whispering Promise Ring grants a small bless buff to improve accuracy for 2 turns. Together, they provide powerful buffs that are easy to trigger whenever the wearer is healed. During combat, Simply use Fighter Second Wind ability or Healing Potion to activate the buffs first before attacking. You could also have another party member do the healing instead, so your bonus action are saved to cast a different buff or do a War Cleric attack in that same turn. For a more efficient approach, you can heal just right before initiating combat to optimize your action economy. Another optimal way is by consuming Raspberry for heals. It's a free action, so no actions are wasted to proc the buffs even in combat. However, Raspberry Source is limited, and they are found in various locations throughout the game. Raspberry are regarded as camp supplies, so try not to eat them by accident when long resting. Strange Conduit Ring adds 1d4 psychic damage to weapon attacks as long as you're concentrating, which can be done by using the Hunter's Mark from Grimskull Helm or Hunting Bow on a summon target. You'll then have permanent duration concentration on Hunter's Mark. Additionally, you could also use Hunter Mark to add more damage on a target whenever you have nothing else to do with bonus action. As you multi-class to Cleric, there'll be more options to choose. Either concentrate on Divine Favor for extra 1d4 radiant damage on weapon attacks, or Shield of Faith for plus 2 AC. Diadem of Arcane Synergy adds your spellcasting modifier to weapon damage. The buff itself is activated when you inflict a condition on enemy, which can be done easily with Ability Drain Illithid Power Learn. Keep in mind before Cleric Multiclass level is taken, 
fighter spellcasting modifier is intelligence. So if you wanted to be more optimal, respect to 16 intelligence or wisdom depends on the build current progression. Boots of Stormy Clamor adds two stacks of reverberation every time you inflict a condition on enemy, dealing additional thunder damage at five stacks and possibly knock target prone. Similar to the diadem, you'll activate the boots aplenty due to ability drain, maneuvers, or special arrows. Reverberation stacks also cause target to have penalty on physical saving throws, so they are more likely to be knocked prone, not just from the boots effect itself, but your trip attack maneuver or ice arrows. Alternatively, use the water sparkers instead if you prefer having more direct damage. To utilize water sparkers, create a water surface by either using rain dancer staff or throwing a water bottle, then stand on it before initiating combat. You'll then gain lightning charges, adding a plus one lightning damage and attack roll to your attacks. Gloves of Archery further adds two damage to ranged weapon attacks. Deathstalker Mantle recommended here is optional. Having the cloak increase your quality of life, but otherwise not a must have if you didn't pick Dark Urge Origin. Equipments highlighted in yellow are buff tools that are not meant to be equipped, but only to strengthen your character before initiating combat. Unlike most other armors, UNT Scale Mail add your full dexterity modifier to AC, making you a very difficult target to hit for enemies. This armor also grant a plus one bonus to initiative, and another plus three initiative from Sentinel Shield, easily securing you the first turn in combat. You can enlarge yourself while carrying big boy staff, adding additional 1d4 damage to weapon attacks. Since it recharges on long rest, you would typically use this ability for bosses. Drake Throat Glaive is only used as a buff tool to give your bow a plus one weapon enhancement, an extra 1d4 elemental damage of choice. You can do so by dropping your bow on the ground before buffing it using the glaive. The effect will last until long rest. Gloves of the Automaton is also a buff tool used to gain advantage on all weapon attacks but the effect only lasts for 10 turns, so you will have to pre-buff it, then switch back to your main gloves before entering combat. When you first arrived in Act 3, buy a statue for 5,000 gold in the circus. Doing so, give your character a permanent bless buff after a long rest and allow you to switch out Whispering Promise for other damaging ring. Resonant Stone is obtainable near the end of Act 2 and can be brought along for the Psychic Damage Vulnerability Aura, which considerably increase damage output on Strange Conduit Ring and Psionic Overload Illithid Power. As very few foes do psychic damage, this aura benefits you much more than for the enemies, and it's preferably carried by a frontliner when playing with a party. Mantle of Holy Warrior has a great AoE buff to precast before a fight for extra radiant damage, though you already have good options for concentration, like Hunter's Mark and Divine Favor. The mantle is more ideal to be used on other party member, so you could stack up more additional damage. Titan String will finally be replaced with a better bow in Act 3. Gaunter Mael is better as it's able to stack more damage with plus 3 weapon enhancement and extra 1d4 radiant damage after using Bolt of Celestial Light, so you should always use it first in combat to buff your weapon before doing rest of the attacks. You also get to use different elixirs to greatly boost damage output, be it Elixir of Bloodlust for an additional action on kill each turn or Elixir of the Colossus for the additional 1d4 weapon damage, which becomes 2d4 on crit, or 4d4 with vulnerability on every attacks. 
Armor of Agility is the upgraded version of Yuan-T. It adds your full dexterity modifier to AC while having better base AC itself and additional plus two saving throws. You should also consider getting Polished Armor. It has an aura that makes nearby enemies vulnerable to piercing, doubling your weapon damage. Unless they have magical piercing resistance, then you'll deal normal damage instead of halved, so it's still very good regardless. When playing with a party, it's preferably to have it equipped on one of your frontliner. Otherwise, you'll have to hug enemies at close range for the vulnerability aura. With Martial Exertion Gloves, you can voluntarily take damage to gain an additional attack and double your movement speed. This additional attack can also use special arrows. When combo with Shield of Thralls, most of the damage will be absorbed by the shield while effectively being able to activate the stun on your own. Any damage taken will get healed right away using Second Wind, and conveniently enough all three abilities recharge on short rest, so this combo can be done quite often. Alternatively, you could use Helldust Gloves for extra 1d6 fire damage on weapon attacks. As for melee weapons, once the recommended stat sticks are obtained, you can dual wield two of them for optimal damage output and ditch the shield. While wielding Rhapsody Dagger, you gain a plus one bonus to damage and attack rolls for every foe killed, up to a maximum of plus three. This effect will last until long rest. Ambusher Short Sword has plus one initiative and deals 1d6 necrotic damage to enemies that haven't taken a turn, which is the case most of the times against you. When no one is contesting for critical gear, you could go for a crit build by using Saravok Helm and Bloodthirst in offhand as alternatives, along with Champion's subclass feature and Elixir of Viciousness. You'd have 25% crit chance on normal attacks, or 43% crit chance with advantage. Potion of Speed is really good for the additional action per turn for more attacks, on top of two bonus AC and doubled move speed. You could also throw the potion on the ground before battle, then walk over the cloud in combat to get hastened without consuming any actions. For those who don't plan on using Illithid power, they can drink Potion of Flying instead for more mobility. If you want to have optimal damage when using Titan String Bow, then chugging Strength Elixirs is the way to go. After you've moved on to using Gaunter Mail Bow, choose either Elixir of Bloodlust or Elixir of Colossus to get more additional damage output However, if you are going for the crit spec, you can consider using Elixir of Viciousness for more crit chance.